Good morning, everyone. Thank you for that hearty good morning. I want to extend a welcome to everyone here today, and I just want to reiterate this because we say it every Sunday, but I want to reiterate that we mean it, that you are welcome here inside of these doors, and we welcome you not be just as a social organization that acknowledges your presence. We welcome you in the name of Jesus Christ, who accepts all those who will come to him and look to him. And so it's our joy and our honor this morning to be among you as we come to worship in his name. A reminder that for the month of April, our local and our foreign missions that we are supporting for this month are Life Without Limbs and the Canaan Land Ministries Children's Home in Brazil. So again, our focus of missions for this month are Life Without Limbs and Canaan Land Ministries Children's Home in Brazil. So as you feel led, please give to those organizations as they seek to propagate the gospel and bless those who are in uh, Christ's care and keeping. You probably noticed there's a lot of hubbub in the kitchen today, a reminder that there is lunch after our morning service, and everyone is invited to uh, join us for lunch. That's after the morning service, we'll have lunch. Prayer meeting this Thursday at 11 a.m. All are invited for that. A prayer meeting again here at church at Thursday. And let's continue to pray for each other as we serve together throughout our days and our weeks that our church would be unified, that we would go strong in Christ, and that we would reach out to those who need to know him as well. As Before we move any further into our service, let's bow to pray. Our Heavenly Father, we ask God that your will will be done in our service, that you would be lifted up and honored, that as we focus on your word, as we seek to see you, as we talked about in Bible class this morning, that we would see you with eyes that are open, um, not just to the state of our own souls, but to the majesty of your kingdom, to the majesty of your presence, and to the beauty of your character, and to the mercy and forgiveness and grace that you shower upon us because of your goodness towards us. We ask God that we would find our salvation in Christ Jesus alone and we would find our certainty in him alone as we gather here this morning that as we worship through prayer, through the singing of songs, through gathering around your word this morning, we ask God that your blessing would be upon it. And even further, as we gather around the table and share food together, that in our own fellowship, that you would be present among us and that we would bring honor and glory to you for you are worthy of all things that we can give you for you have truly given us everything in Christ Jesus. We ask and pray for your blessing on this time now in Jesus' name, amen. Let's all stand as God calls us to worship him. A psalm of praise. Make a joyful noise unto the Lord, all you lands. Serve the Lord with gladness. Come before his presence with singing. Know that the Lord, he is God. It is he that has made us, and not we ourselves. We are his people, and the sheep of his pasture. Enter into his gates with thanksgiving, and into his courts with praise. Give thanks to him, and bless his name. For the Lord is good, his mercy is everlasting, and his truth endures to all generations. Let's open to number 492 in the blue hymnals. Verses one through three.
You may be seated. Next number, 493. Next number, 495.
finally number 497. Good morning, everyone. Let's pray together. Lord, thank you, Father, for these people that have gathered today to be together in your name. And um, we look forward to being together with a meal and um, for our bodies, but also for our spirits. Lord, please feed us from your word and um, communicate to our hearts by your spirit that which you would want us to know. In Jesus' name, amen. We'll be in 2 Corinthians chapter 4, continuing on there. 2 Corinthians 4, and we'll finish out the chapter from verse 13 to the end. And today's message is called, The Burden of Glory. I will read for us um, our text, starting in verse 13. 
Since we have the same spirit of faith according to what has been written, I believed and so I spoke. We also believe and so we also speak, knowing that he who raised the Lord Jesus will raise us also with Jesus and bring us with you into his presence. For it is all for your sake, so that as grace extends to more and more people, it may increase thanksgiving to the glory of God. So we do not lose heart. Though our outer self is wasting away, our inner self is being renewed day by day. For this light momentary affliction is preparing for us an eternal weight of glory beyond all comparison. As we look not to the things that are seen, but to the things that are unseen. For the things that are seen are transient, but the things that are unseen are eternal. So right at the outset, we have to notice again who is present in this text. So we're going to be good exegetes and interpreters of the scripture. And almost more importantly, just be good listeners to the text. What is the author trying to say to his readers at that time? And by extension, what does it mean for us now, reading it 2,000 years later in a different language, on the other side of the world. Can we just let the text come out and say what, what it wants to say and what the author is trying to communicate? Paul is still using language here. It says we and you or us and you. He is speaking here still of his ministry with the other apostles and specifically with Timothy in writing this letter. So the we is Paul and Timothy, and the you is the church that he's writing to. I know many of us, and myself included, often look at texts like this and immediately identify ourselves with the we. We see the we and we go, oh, I, that's me too. We, I'm in that we. Of course we do that, but do you really identify with the we here with Paul? Because honestly, it doesn't always seem that great when you consider the apostles' lives crucified upside down, beheaded, persecuted, rejected. Even if you did want to, let's say that you did, what evidence do you have, and I'm looking at myself too, that they would accept you, that they would count you as one of them, that you actually do identify with the, the we or the us, I'll tell you, if your mind goes to accolades, um, your own achievements, or figuring out an argument to prove how great you think you are, you're probably going to be counted out. Because that's not what makes the apostles worthy. How does your life point to the fact that you are included? Or as Paul says, that God will one day bring you into his presence. Because the door is narrow, and the path is straight, and there's only one way in. Paul writes, since we have this same spirit of faith, according to what has been written, he quotes Psalm 116, so you can turn with me there to Psalm 116. Paul is saying, he and Timothy have the same spirit of faith that King David had. And that's a tall order in itself. And here's what King David says. I'll read 14 verses for us from that psalm. I love the Lord because he has heard my voice and my pleas for mercy. Because he has, cli he, he has inclined his ear to me. Therefore, I will call on him as long as I live. The snares of death encompass me. The pangs of Sheol laid hold on me. I suffered distress and anguish. Then I called on the name of the Lord. O Lord, I pray, deliver my soul. Gracious is the Lord and righteous. Our God is merciful. The Lord preserves the simple. When I was brought low, he saved me. 
Return, O my soul, to your rest, for the Lord has dealt bountifully with you. For you have delivered my soul from death, my eyes from tears, my feet from stumbling. I will walk before the Lord in the land of the living. I believed even when I spoke, I am greatly afflicted. I said in my alarm, all mankind are liars. What shall I render to the Lord for all his benefits to me? I will lift up the cup of salvation and call on the name of the Lord. I will pay my vows to the Lord in the presence of all his people. And we'll conclude there. But look at verse 8 and 9. Um, just an interesting note. Do you see the extension that you have delivered my soul? And then it's in three parts. My soul, my eyes, and my feet. The very depth of who I am, everything that I see, and everywhere that I go, God has delivered it all. And so the result in the next verse then is that he walks with the Lord. There's a connection between God's work and deliverance in David's life and how that work changes his life and how he walks it out. And that's here also in the Corinthian text. Because the next verse is what's quoted, verse 10. Paul says, we too believe, and so we also speak. What about you? Do you believe? Do you speak? How do you know? What does your life look like in your best moments of believing? What does your life look like in your best moments of speaking? of acting out God's deliverance in your life. How would you like to walk that out moving forward? There's a couple of different renderings of verse 10 in the psalm. It could be, I believed even when I spoke, as I read, or I believed indeed I spoke, which is a real close, it's almost an interchangeable relationship or inseparable between believing and speaking. I believed indeed I spoke, like the speaking is assumed. Or the Septuagint renders it, I believed, therefore I spoke, which is more of a causal relationship that the speaking is a natural outflow of the belief. But all of these are just different flavors of the word key, which is just a conjunction. Out of context, the word is translated that, when, but, if, indeed, surely, because, though, yes. So you can see how flexible translation really is with all those possibilities. What's important for us this morning is the definitive idea that there is a relationship between belief and speech. King David perhaps the best picture in scripture of God's heart in a human being apart from Christ. He said, I believe, indeed, I spoke. What did he speak? Without turning this into a whole sermon on Psalm 116, there are at least three aspects that David speaks in this poem. One, there is a cry for help with an acknowledgement of suffering. Two, there is a spoken indictment on all people. All mankind are liars, and people are bad. We are bad. If you don't think we're that bad, you're probably not being very honest with yourself. Or you could just watch the news for 20 seconds. The last thing that seems to be spoken is a praise to God in thanksgiving, especially in the presence of other people, as you can see in the conclusion of the psalm. This is important because in the midst of the speaking, in the midst of the cry for help, and the acknowledgement of the sinfulness of all people, there is a hope that God will deliver his people in spite of everything. So let's look back at Corinthians now, and we'll go through that text. Paul says, essentially, we speak because we know we know that the God who raised the Lord Jesus 
will raise us also with him and bring us with you into his presence. And that's a glorious hope. That's part of the reason he says in verse 16, so we do not lose heart. Do do you see that? The glorious hope that they will be brought into God's presence is part of the reason he can say and does not lose heart. Part of the reason because there's another piece and it's broken up in two parts in verse 15. We'll try to try to look at that and see if that can make sense to us. Part of the reason Paul does not lose hope. The whole ministry, it's not for Paul. It's not for Timothy. They are the suffering ones. They are the shards of clay. King David talked about his suffering in Psalm 116. So part one of the reason why Paul doesn't lose heart is because the ministry is for people. It's all for their sake. It was for us. We are more closely identified immediately with the you here in this verse, right? That God, who raised the Lord Jesus, will raise us also with him and bring us with you, the church, into his presence. So we have the apostles and we got everybody else. Yet the ministry is greater than Paul and greater than the apostles. Let's see if you can understand this. They won't reach their end by this ministry. They won't be exhausted by trying to provide for themselves. Trying to make it, it's already done. In terms of the ministry, what is there to lose heart about? It's not about them. The ministry is spoken so that grace may go out to more and more people and that thanksgiving may increase. And the second part of why Paul doesn't lose heart, the purpose of the ministry, its aim is God's glory. As they speak the message of grace, that God came down to us in order to reconcile the whole cosmos back to himself, produces thanksgiving. So I hope this does not seem trite, uh, old news, thankfulness, glory. I've heard it all before a million times. If it does, I may challenge you that you aren't thinking deeply enough about it and that you need a bigger picture because God is eternal. God's glory leaves people in shambles. Read any account in the scriptures. Isaiah said, I am a man undone, unclean, and everyone around me is the same way, though they may not see it yet. And just a note on thankfulness, there are just a few postures left when you really boil down the Christian faith. Thankfulness is very much a core posture in the disciple of Christ. It acknowledges that something greater than you and outside yourself has given you something useful that you wouldn't have had otherwise. You didn't get it on your own. It was given. The gospel points to God's goodness and ultimately points to his glory, his many benefits wrapped up in his son and in his love for us. This is the purpose of Paul's ministry, to glorify God. And that's why he doesn't lose heart, because anything beginning or ending with ourselves is short-lived. Transient, he will say. Dull, really. Shallow. But he doesn't lose heart because... There is something greater than him calling him to new heights and depths of experience as he walks out the gospel of redemption. That's why Paul can be okay in verse 16, that his outer self is wasting away. How can you be okay with that? His inner self is being renewed day by day, one day at a time. It is as he partakes in the ministry as he speaks, that he is being strengthened, renewed. And remember, earlier in chapter 3 in Corinthians, in verse 18, we all, with unveiled face, beholding the glory of the Lord, are being transformed 
into the same image from one degree of glory to another, for this comes from the Lord, who is the Spirit. All who are in Christ, all people, Paul says, included with the apostles, are being changed as we experience the Christian life, as we behold his glory in fellowship with him, and in the ministry of the gospel, we are changed, we are renewed, we're able to press on for one more day. And this process is preparing us for something that is truly great, something unbearable in our current state. The weight of glory waiting to be revealed in us is unlike anything that we have ever felt before. Have you ever been on the bottom of a dog pile? And we just did one at Terrence's place a couple weeks ago. Jason was on the bottom, and I was on top of him. And then as each guy piled on top, I thought I could feel Jason's ribs bend a little bit under the, the weight of us. So I put my arms out kind of in a push-up position to take some weight off of him. But it was just, it was close to 1,000 pounds. I couldn't move the pile. But I know, Jason, you could take it, right? You could take it much more. This weight doesn't compare to that. Your ribs are gone. Dust. The word weight doesn't appear again in this letter. But Paul uses it two other times in his other letters, and it's interesting. In Galatians 6.2, he writes, Bear one another's weight, and so fulfill the law of Christ. It's often translated burdens there. Or this one in 1 Thessalonians, Paul writing again in 2.6, Nor did we seek glory from people, whether from you or from others, though we could have made demands as apostles of Christ, but we were gentle among you, like a nursing mother taking care of her own children. Can you guess what word it was in that last one? What the word weight was in the Thessalonians? It would be easier maybe if you were looking at it. The word in Thessalonians is demands. So it's like we could have thrown our weight around with you, uh, exercised our authority given to us as apostles among you. We could have made demands among you, but we didn't. We were taking care of you like a nursing mother with her child. The weight. So as a side note, um, I think this in Thessalonians was not about Paul wanting to make demands based on his authority. I think Christ-given authority just has a different philosophy. And, and it's kind of behind that is the idea of meekness where uh, the power or authority isn't manifest in the same way the world manifests it, um, in dominance, conquering, the power comes out in gentleness. The most powerful gentleness ever known to man, of course. But it's a different use of the same power. Paul didn't throw his weight around and make demands, though he could have. And at times, maybe he did. It's just a, it's a different category. But do these three usages of the word burden or weight or demand give you a sense of what that weight is that we're being prepared for. It's not any one of them specifically. That's kind of how interpretation works. It's not just one of those things. And you haven't felt this weight. And it's not just a burden. It's not just pressure. It's not just a demand. But the weight of glory is demanding in a sense. Uh, requiring something from our being that we cannot give right now. And as we gaze not, on the, not upon the things that are passing by, but upon the things that are founded, the things that are in place, 
that are firm and eternal, established for us, as we gaze upon those things, we are being prepared to give what the weight is demanding from us. The weight is pulling on our soul. The eternal burden of glory is too great for us now. But we can experience glimpses of it. And it leads us, leaves us like shards of clay as God holds us together. So in conclusion, I want to circle back to the beginning of the message, the us and the you language, and just leave you with some questions to think about. If you want to be included in the us with Paul and the apostles and King David, um, and you want to be brought by God into his own presence with Christ, um, I'll ask, what is your ministry of the gospel like? Is your ministry like the apostles? Um, and so what does that look like? Here are at least three things. Is your ministry spoken? Do you believe and speak? Two, does your ministry produce thanksgiving in you and in those that you minister to? And three, is your ministry aimed at the glory of God, putting him on display and not yourself? tender and compassionate to those that you minister to. And I want to do one more thing before we close. Um, if you want to be a part of this ministry of reconciliation, if you want to be a part of Christ's mission, we have many people here who are already doing that ministry, who are the us, and are primed and ready to help you. So here's who they are. If, if you're an elder a minister, or a deacon, can you please stand up? So these beautiful people. If you're a young person, we have a deacon of youth, that's David. Um, if you're a woman, we have Sharon, the deacon of women's ministries. Cora Music, Ben is business, he runs a business. Ralph's not here. Michael's a minister, John is one of our elders. Or you can talk to any one of them. They're ready to serve you with gentleness and with Christ's love. You guys can sit down. Thank you. They're ready to serve you. And if you're watching this online, you can find us on Google. We're here in Southeast Portland. You can send an email or call. We want to serve you as well. I'll just pray for us to conclude. Father, thank you for your word. Thank you for teaching us. Help us to understand more and more, Lord, of, of your goodness, that we would find our identity more and more founded on you and on Christ, being fearless and being open and pure in heart like we heard this morning in Bible class, that we would be one directional, that we would seek your kingdom first above all things, and that it would go out and result in thanksgiving, and that more and more people would experience your grace from our lips and from our lives. We thank you for this gathering in Jesus' name. Amen. was a wretch. I remember who I was. I was lost. I was blind. I was running out of time. Sin separated. The breach was far too wide. But from the far side of the chasm, you held
Let's all stand for a closing prayer and a closing hymn. Dear Lord, thank you for this day that we can be together and worship you and set aside our worries to just focus on you and love each other. And thank you for this church body. And we pray that you would be with us as we go, that we would um, prepare ourselves for the way of glory you have prepared for us in your name. Let's close with number 513.